All right, welcome everybody. This is our Rise Up and Carve demo session. Uh, we are going to be talking with George, let me spotlight him, and with Phil. Where'd you go, Phil? Sorry, I got to go find you on my grid. There you are. Let me uh, spotlight you as well. So we are going to be talking with George and with Phil about making knife handles. So for all of you out there who have blades, uh, maybe you've got some Nick Westerman blades, maybe you've got blades from other you know, makers, maybe you've got some old Mora knives that you don't like the handle on or may, uh, other knives that you just want to replace the handle. These guys are going to talk us through uh, some uh, tips, tricks, and processes for making knife handles and knife handle design and all that sort of good stuff. So with that, I will turn it over to George and Phil and let you guys take it away. Yes, thank you, Chuck. Um, yeah, so our idea was to uh, spice up a little bit the template thingy um, on Rise Up, and um, I have several blades lying around waiting for a handle, and I know from other people who has the same problem, and I heard a few times that some people are a little bit, um, I don't know the, if shy is the right words, to make a knife handle, and I just want to take the, the fear from the people to just do it, um, um, and yeah, a bad handle is better than no handle. Um, and uh, if you are able to make your own handle, you, you can always modify and, and make it a good handle. So um, yes, so the template is, as I always like my templates, just as a direction to point to. And this is a knife I was making a little bit before I was getting into spoon carving. And this is um, what I call my knife handle sort of it's some kind of whale shape how i call it and that's one of um, the templates um so um by then i was um, coming from uh, hammer handle making and i still used uh, sandpaper and, and stuff um, but this is sometimes really helpful for knife handles because then you can use more fancy naughty um, colorful wood um, and I was playing around with the, uh, with the hills over here with um, some uh, also some curves and stuff like that. And Phil was taking uh, um, picking that up and was experimenting with that a lot too. Um, and I'm always try to go a little bit more ergonomic. So I fairly have knife handles which are really symmetric or something because your hand is usually not very symmetric as well. So I always, I looked at this knife, what are the grips? So this is one grip. So the knife is like a little bit bended in this direction to, to get into the hand like that. And if you do push cuts, if you do the this, it, it's sort of a little bit thicker, a little bit also like, like a more blade mm -hmm. style to fit into, into your, your hand like that, to do to, to thumb push thingies. And it's short enough to, to don't get into your way when you, when you do the wrist, the chicken thing. Um, yeah, and so that was the start about it. And uh, this is a more uh, octangular version of, of that. Mm -hmm. Knife thingy, um, and then um, yeah, maybe you spotlight the 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 yellow phone. Okay. So um, and and this is a handle, for example, which is like really asymmetric, but I, I always took this piece of wood in my hand and thought, okay, here I usually have my thumb. So I just cut away this. And when I hold it, hold it like this, my hand fits in like that. So it's sort of an ugly looking handle, but it's actually quite comfortable. Um, then I have the, here I, I played around with uh, a Mora style octagonal thingy. Mm -hmm. Here, another octangular with birch bark. And um, yeah, another whale shape 
So I'm, I'm go later I'm going to show, I think, something like this. Okay. Um, and so I just try to play around with a lot of variations and try to find out what I like. Yeah. These are pretty much the slide handles I have here to show. And then here it comes to the um, hook knives, which are fairly longer. So this is pretty much the, the handle I have on template sheet. Okay. The hook knife. So there's a hook knife handle and uh, two slide knives handles. Do you and find, I, are, are there yeah. any, are there any other commercial knife makers that you particularly like their handles, whether for hooks or for sloids? Um, I pretty much like them all. And so, um, so there's Confort, which has a beautiful handle. It's quite simple oval. Then I really like the McWhite. It's a simple octagonal mainly. Yeah. For roughing, I really like the Hans Kart because it's a strong, um, strong short blade. Um, what else? Uh, also, the slide from McWhite I really like. Yeah. I think he um, calls that sort of a clamshell kind of a shape, a razor yeah. clam. Uh, Reach Lars is really comfortable as well. This is just like an octagonal, but just many, many more passive. So yep. uh, several octagonal, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Here I have another whale shape on me. I yeah, the whale know. shape, I think, see, I, I've seen, that's what I think, um, what's their names? The the big U.S. manufacturer, uh, FlexCut, they do that sort of whale or porpoise style. Yeah, yes, this may But be. it's more extreme. Uh, it's a little too extreme for my taste. Yeah. But, yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. The, the, I also like the um, uh, Robin Hood, which is also really simple, optical yep. thing, so yeah. Awesome. Uh, I, I was also playing around with three cams and this pistol shape handles. Yeah, fancy knife handles. So I, I was doing a kitchen knife before I do did carving knife. So this is still a kitchen knife I have made. And here I also played around this uh, asymmetric asymmetry. Uh -huh. so, yeah, so I think a main thing I would like to point out is that I really like to um, make a shape which points out the direction of the cut. So, um, so this is a little bit tapered to where the cutting edge is on this blade. Okay. So that you can feel where the cutting edge is pointing to. Uh, yeah, so um, if, I don't know if, if that is understandable. So, yeah, um, so when you say tapered, the... you mean tapered in the vertical dimension as it approaches the, the blade? Yeah. I, yeah so I, I so think... in cross section, it's fatter at the top and thinner at the bottom in the cross section, yeah? Yes, so the, the, the thinner part is... So at the bottom. The, the back is thicker. The bottom is thinner, and that shows me when I hold the, the handle okay. where the cutting edge is, so that you get a muscle memory where where your blade is. If that gotcha. is so, here you see the cutting edge is there, and you can feel how when you hold it, you know exactly without looking where the where the where the blade is cutting. Gotcha. Um, yes. Uh, so this is something that will. So I, I was maybe thinking this month, where until the show and tell, I tried to make as many knife handles as possible. So this is, will be a Sean Hellman, a little bit fancier knife handle. I, I'm working on. I'm planning on doing a ladle handle for for my copper ladles, and yeah, all that stuff. <laughs>
So maybe Phil take it away and talk about it and some more, and then I go outside and prepare for that. Thank, thank you, George. So George um, is the master of tools, as we all know on Ruac. Um, one, one, <laughs> other thing, one other things that um, George is able to do is to show a huge variety of different tools from proprietary makers. Um, one of the things we hope to try and get across is don't be frightened, have a go. And probably the most important thing is make it to fit you. So um, be prepared to experiment. Um, George showed me his knives early on and started informing my, my approaches to making knife handles. But one of the things I did that I found really helpful was to use some pastry or some Play-Doh to just squeeze in your hand and it'll give you some sort of an imprint of your hand and give you some dimensions to work to. Now, I'm not suggesting you make each of the fingerprint marks in it. Uh, I did go down that path and that's nearly impossible to use. Um, it feels great in one specific position, but using it to carve a spoon, forget mm. it. it. It just doesn't work out. It really doesn't. But getting the sizes, because actually, um, just, just going like this and looking for the sizes of your, your hand, hand doesn't really, really tell you that much. Lump of plasticine, a lump of pastry, squeeze it to how you like to grip your hand, and it's going to give you half of your um, dimensions straight off the bat. Mm. But the key thing is make it to suit you. Um, play with other people's knives, have a feel for it. You'll get some way of a, a feel of what you like, what you prefer. You'll also get a feel for the types of material, whether you want it laminated, the, the aesthetics of the, of the blades at the same time. So that's probably enough talking generally about knives. The, the designs are almost limitless. I'd suggest you start simple and grow from there. Um, the dolphin shape is fairly easy to produce. Um, it's quite simple in terms of layout. And it also helps lining up the drill hole, which is the critical thing to keep things straight and central right at the beginning. Now, George has got outside into where he works outdoors. Um, Chuck, if you could jump across to George again. Okay, to George or to, yeah, the iPhone, hold on. So the iPhone. Yeah. Yep. So um, here um, I, I uh, like to use the spoon mule uh, for the most of these things. I have now here um, a simple piece of ash. I squared it down to a decent size that it fits into the mule, that it's still big enough to, to, uh, to give me a handle. It's way too long right now, but uh, we can still cut something off. So I just start um, um, drilling, uh, painting, drawing the shape of, of the knife I'm aiming for. And so I just start with that. So here I have oh. the little helper facets. So I can, I, can, I, can I ask one question? Yes. So you shape your handle before you drill it? Uh, yeah, that's... that's um, George does, I don't. Because every <laughs> the reason I ask is every time I've tried it, <clears throat> excuse me, I then have a hard time holding the handle uh, like in a vise uh, to get make sure I drill the hole in a, in a, in a, in a proper alignment. Yes, uh, so I, um, yeah, it's, there's no answer to that question. So I like to uh, um, do the, the shape of the handle quite exact before that. Okay. What you can do uh, is because I'm, I'm, I, I'm okay with drilling the hole okay later. Okay. Uh, but I found out that to drill the hole uh, and use a drill press won't help you to make the perfect hole uh, because uh, usually uh, the, the wood you use is maybe just axed out and stuff like that. So it's not like super duper um, straight or something. So what you can do is if you want to drill the hole first, you could use a chopstick or something and stick it in the hole so that you see where the, uh, yeah, look at Phil now, he's showing that to you. Oh, so if on. you drill first, um, 
if you drill first, you put a chopstick uh, into that hole and then you know where the blade is pointing to. So as you can see, Phil has a lace, he has a drill press, so he can work with quite an equipment. So in this, this way, it's easier to drill first, make a nice hole that is really straight and parallel to everything, stick a chopstick in it and work your handle. Gotcha. Okay, so sorry, that, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow. Okay. No, that, that's okay. So I, I uh, will do that handle now and um, then you will, we will see if I will succeed. <laughs> George, okay. George, can I interrupt you a second? So, so one of the things George and I are really keen on is please do ask questions as we go. Uh, this is not meant to be a teaching as such. It's, it's a discussion. So if you've got questions, ask them and we'll try and answer them as we go along or throw it open to everyone else to join in. Exactly. So I start with just the outlines. So just like with a spoon, carve the silhouette. Yeah. that wave shape had this one thing that's not so easy that you have to deal with the grain change in this part so that's yeah you have to somehow work around that and do a little knife finish after um so i got this silhouette now uh, and now i'm just drawing The upper direction. Uh, so I'm a right-hander, so this will uh, will lie smooth in my hand like this. So we have again to deal with a little uh, grain change in this part. I need to new leather jaws. So if you notice, George almost uses his draw knife like an axe and does the helper facets on either side and then takes off the side that you just created. So a triangle, triangle, then cuts off the middle of that triangle, just like you do with an axe when you're axing out a billet. Yeah. And now you can, I already start this little facet to do the eight square thing. Now this is the part I need to do with the knife later on, to get more precise. So needless to say, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't have a, a spoon mule and a draw knife, uh, you're going to be doing this with axe and, and, a, and a hand knife. It's just going to take you a little longer. Um, yes. Um, um, I mean, you can use everything you use normally in spoon carving. Yep. Um, if you're more familiar with the with with knife, with the axe, with whatever you use, uh, then do that. Um, or even a coping saw. Um, yeah, coping saw is good. Uh, band saw is good as well. So um, there, are, there are many, many options. Um, and I leave now a little bit more space. Um, on the, I leave a little bit material. Uh, I leave the wood longer as I need it. So that you even can clamp it in the normal vise. So if you have a draw knife um, and um, don't have a spoon mule, uh, you can use that as well in the vines. So I, I leave that 
strawberry thingy in the back. But um, yeah, so I think I'm done with this right now. Uh, I would uh, go further on with the knife from that point. Um, but I also want to show you how to uh, use um, uh, a rasp and, and a file. So um, we can now switch places again into the workshop. And okay. Then, uh, yeah. So while George is switching places, uh, we've only really just got started, but are there any questions that are burning in people's minds that they'd like to ask at this point? Uh, hi, I feel, um, is it always better to start off with a longer piece of wood? So, so it, it depends how you're approaching the job. So I, I start with approximately the right size. Um, but that's because I, I use uh, um, axe and a knife and sometimes even a bandsaw to cut out the profile. Um, that for me works best because I've already drilled my hole. I drill mm. a hole first and then mark out for the shape. So it, it re really depends which of the approaches you're following. And there isn't really a right and wrong way. What matters is getting the, the drill hole central and making something that's good for you to grip. Mm. I suppose, is it easier to work with, particularly with um, a spoon mule, if it's a bit longer, I guess, is it? I don't know. Of, of course it is, yeah, absolutely. Really good point. So, so the, the tools you're going to use in some ways govern or drive the approach you, you follow thereafter. Yeah, great, thanks. So um, what I have is this thing. Um, so if you gonna want to shape your your um, handle uh, with the, with a rasp because you have maybe really nice figured uh, wood or something, I, I made this thing on the lace and the, uh, the I clamp it in the vise and you can now stick the handle in it uh, and it holds like that and you can turn it all around and you can hold it like this and you. You can use that as a counter, how you say. Um, so it's an easier way to, to hold the handle like this. You can also just go with a hole and, and a block if you don't have a lace. This was the first thing I made for myself. So that you have some kind of a jig that holds the wood so in the chat we're being asked what what woods are suitable for making knife handles a quick answer would be pretty much anything you make a spoon hand a spoon from will be suitable but obviously harder the better generally um so long as you're still prepared to carve and, and manipulate the wood still so yeah. all of the fruit woods those sorts of things Ash, I find particularly helpful because it splits into nice billets straight off. If you keep the, the wood longer, you can clamp it in the vise like that. <laughs> and as you can see, you can really quickly um, um, get to a shape you like. <laughs> Like that, you can remove a lot of wood really quickly. So one of the reasons that George is showing using a rasp is it is an, another way of doing it. But equally, somewhere along the line, you might be in a position where you've got a blade, but not a handle. So you need to be able to produce a handle without carving it. So um, now I'm, uh, no, I have to go take away here. So, um, so I think it's really nice to use wood you usually not use for spoon carving because it has knots, it has figuring, it has 
So all the beautiful stuff, which is complicated to carve, um, you can use for a handle. Um, and then it's really much easier to uh, use with uh, the rasp to, to get, take, uh, take off a lot of wood. So Kaylin, your question about um, seasoned wood, generally I use seasoned wood and, and George doesn't use brand new green wood, but the nearer to season, it tends to be more stable. Uh, and I, I do go through, cut it a year before and leave it to dry. It's not critical to be fair. Yeah, that's another reason you want to have quite dry wood uh, when uh, working with a handle, making a handle, because you don't want your handle to warp or to to split when you when you uh, fit in the blade or something. So I have a, a, a rough rasp and a fine rasp. So the next step is just a fine rasp. Now, are those Nick Westerman rasps? <laughs> Sorry, what? ignore me. I'm just being a troublemaker. <laughs> nice one. It was too loud. I didn't hear what you said. It was unimportant. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So um, enough for that. You don't need to watch me grasping and filing and stuff like that. Another thing is what you can really was helpful is then the evil slide paper. <laughs> so you get, you get a strip like that and. You can get up uh, the material really light and quickly. So it's some kind of your homemade bent uh, belt sander. Um, and it's even better than a normal belt sander because the normal band belt sander often um, grinds like flat spot because it take off too much. And this uh, technique, you, you round the belt around the, the, the handle and uh, yeah. So, so we keep trying to emphasize that it's a comparatively simple thing. You don't need a lot of tools. Uh, for example, a week or so ago, Suzanne was over and we managed to knock out quite a few handles with literally a drill and a knife. And those are the tools we used. So, um, yeah. So, so Adrian's asking a question, George, about rounding and facets. And I think there isn't a perfect answer. But over to you, George. I think that's preference. So, um, in general, I would say a carving knife uh, is nice if it has no facets. Uh, so, a sloid knife. Uh, don't need facets and uh, hook knife is better with facets because the motion you're doing with the knife is different. So the slide handle you just grab and it needs to be comfortable in your hand and you have maybe two mm. or maximum three positions of the knife in your hand uh, and you most of the time just pull um, and the handle on a hook knife you twist a lot, you turn it. Um, so it's nicer to have more grip. Like it's like a, like a bolt uh, is eight square and that's why you have to turn it. And um, whatever, a kitchen knife nearly never has um, any facets because you there's, there's no need to. So that would be my answer to eight square or not. Um, so that's, so George has talked through the, the challenges between a hook knife and a sloyd knife. Um, and we've also both suggested it's personal preference, really. I, my preference is to leave knife finish on wherever I can, which actually leaves micro facets, which really do help with a grip. But at the same time, it's almost universal. You can put it in any position. Mm -hmm. 
So um, now is maybe the time to, to cut the handle. Um, I start with, with the top. Great camera person. Yeah. So now, it, now this is a little bit too thick. So I take a moment. So there's also no no right or wrong. So uh, now I use the rasp, but this is much quicker with the with the knife to just slim the tip top of the handle. And here I can use my pick, smooth that out again. And it's still nice to have a little bit longer piece on the back. to drill the hole. Because it's a slide knife, usually the tang is a little bit offset. So I want to drill the hole a little bit, not in the so total center. I want to drill it a little bit above. For those that with a little less experience, it's often useful to actually hold the blade up to the handle and start thinking about where you want your center line to be. It's all too easy to end up with a um, symmetrical handle when actually on a slide blade, you don't want it symmetrical. It's all biased to the, to the top of the blade. Can you explain that a little bit more? I'm not sure I understood what you meant. So, so if this is the blade of the knife and here is the handle, you, it's useful to mess about with lifting up and down to see where you think is gonna be the most comfortable for you. On a slide knife, it tends to be biased towards the top. So the, the blade is nearer the top of the handle rather than the exact center of the wood, yes? Okay. Is that clarified, Chuck? Yep. Cheers. So now what I do is um, I start, so the, the first few millimeters are the most important. So I really try to, to create a little dip where the drill fits in. And now I try to align the drill with the handle. And I just see a few uh, turns of the drill and I switch position. So now I'm about one inch into the handle. So now I can go a little faster. So now George has effectively got a pilot hole that's nice and straight. If needed, he can open it out to suit the dimensions of the tang a little more. In a good tool shop, you sometimes find extra long drills, and these are really neat for, uh, for handles. When you spin it, you can see that it's nicely aligned so if, if this would walk to one side too much yeah yeah so now i can go a little bit more aggressive into the handle i check not to go too far in. And then you have to um, find the right rule for your blade. I mean, um, I don't know yet what which blade I want to fit in, so I don't know 
which five I could go. So the extra long blades are available on the internet. So the eBay's got them, they're relatively cheap and it's well worth getting the ones that sort of 100, 150 mil long, makes a big difference to the job later on. Now, uh, can I ask a question, Phil? Is, is there a sort of rule of thumb that you should drill further than the tang? You know, like at a 10 mil, 20 mil longer than the tang or something, is that better for the epoxy or? So, so it does help stop the piston effect, which we were going to talk about later. But yeah, it's, it's useful to go further than the tang of your, the, the mm. knife that you're going to put into it. But don't go daft. Um, it's all too easy to come out the other end. Thanks. So as you can see, um, I managed luckily to align. So I just stick the, the last drill into the hole. And it, I think it's looking OK. It's not. Filters to one or the other side. Yeah, maybe in this position a little bit, but we can correct that maybe later. So, so what I do now with this handle is, um, um, I cut off the the end bit of it. Oops. Other saws are available. <laughs> uh, Brilliant camera work, Yvonne. Thank you. <laughs> So what I really like on handles, and which makes it much quicker and much more quick and easy is to, to burn the handle. Um, if you have a torch, um, that's a really nice thing to, um, you need much less grinding and refining of the handle. Um, you can even bring out the, the, the growth rings. So because the, the, the harder part of the growth ring will will pop up and not burn away so quickly. Um, and the, the, the burned material is really nice on your hands. It really moves really nice. So um, this is definitely not nicely grounded, but I think the shape is quite okay. And when you now, just, it will be loud now uh, a little bit. Um, so so I just George is gonna scorch, scorch the outside of the handle. And after that, what's nice is to have um, a wire brush. And you just rub off the burnt stuff. So this wood has like really big growth in, so um, it, it's not ideal. It's nice always from the smaller growth in. Um, but as you can see, you don't see any uh, marks from the grinding or from the filing anymore. And it's a really smooth finish. Uh, you can wash that off now with this brown stuff. And uh, after you wash it and let it dry again, you oil it and it's pretty much done. So, yeah, you still feel the warm up. So, so, George, what material, what wood have you used on that handle? It didn't look like ash to me. Oh, it is. It was ash. Oh, okay. It's ash. It looked darker yes. than ash, even the start. Could, could, could you hear what I say about the brushing and the burning? I, I forgot that. Uh, I could, but it was quite faint. Okay, so yeah, uh, burning and brushing um, gets gives you a really quick finish on on the handle. Um, yeah, you can put now a little bit of oil on it, and the linseed oil I usually use. Um, um, so. Rubbing it a little bit. It, it, um, so this hand was before 
uh, this hand was quite um, so there's not much coming off anymore. And when you put a little bit of oil on it and give it a good rub, uh, that will um, it will be done right really quickly. And and if, if no uh, coal or no burnt wood will come off later. So what's also really nice, I think, is when you play around with the burning that you keep uh, parts uh, not burned or if you have facets, you can highlight the facets. Mm. So, um, yeah, just play around with it, whatever you like. So, um, I think this is a nice handle for a more. Uh, maybe we can just. So, yeah, what do, you, what do you do now to open up the slot? Because a more a blade, right? It's going to be a a rectangular. Yes, there are two options. Um, for one, there's a special tool I'm looking for. It needs to be here on the desk. So, so there's already a drill hole. George is now going to talk about broaching that hole out so that it spreads it from being just a round hole into an oval that eventually you can make into a slot. So these are homemade tools generally um yes. keyhole saws with the, some of the back cut off uh, ground off so that you've got a, quite a strong set ideally the same thickness as the blade that you want to fit or slightly smaller and you use that effectively to file out the slot uh. so um, yeah this is from the jigsaw um and i just grind round off the the back so that this, these T's fit in the in the drilling hole. Uh, if you want, it's much more work to um, go with a small hole. When you when the hole is bigger, you it's quicker. But then the 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 slot, the, this round hole is much bigger, and it doesn't look so perfect when you put in fit in the blade. So George, while you're um, fitting the with the brooch there. There are, of course, other techniques. You can burn in the blade. Uh, yeah, just, people get very worried about burning in the blade. It's not as difficult as it sounds. Um, no, I, I, can, I, I can quickly show you how to do that. Just a moment. Um, yeah, so you can... And, of course, you can chain drill. So use a smaller... You've got your central hole that you've taken right from the beginning. And you can chain drill above and below that and angle them into your original drill hole to make a more oval or more elongated slot as well. So, mm. so I, to put, sorry. So I will fit this Mara knife into there. Um, but the, the tang is um, usually a stick through. Um, so there's much more stuff on that blade. I, uh, I, I don't need all of that. So. What you should always do first is to um, put tape on your blade because uh, otherwise you can ruin it quite quickly. Not to mention cut yourself by accident. <laughs> that would be my mistake. <laughs> and I know that it's true. I worked with Chuck and Israel together. <laughs> hey, I actually escaped unscathed from Israel. Nearly, yeah. When you don't cut yourself, you get any other infection. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, that's true. I got COVID, but I didn't cut that's myself. It's <laughs> a mean one. Sorry. So most of the tanks are um, soft metal. So what I can do here is just cut it off. So, um, someone asking a question? I don't think so. I think it was background noise, Chuck. Okay. So, what's sort of important when you do a burn in tank is that you put wet paper on the on the blade. We have to check where the cutting edge is on the top. 
Ideal being so usually. Used the, what, what did you say? I'm just going to say yeah. that, that it's really ideal to use a metal vice if you can, because it helps with the heat absorption and stops the heat transferring into the blade as mm. well. Absolutely. So if you haven't got a gas torch, if you've got a gas stove, you can use that just as well. So here's a chance to realign the blade. If there's any inaccuracies, you can start burning it in and look at, keep looking down the blade to see whether you're aligned appropriately or not. What did you say, Chuck? I, I, I can't hear you when because the burner is too loud. I was still. So it was me saying that you, while you're burning in the hand, the blade, the tang, you get a chance to slightly realign. If there's any inaccuracies, you can lean a little bit to try and straighten that out and it'll burn slightly straighter for you. Absolutely. <laughs> So you can see you don't need to rush. There's no big panic and rush to it. And um, people worry about changing the temper in the blade. So long as it's properly cooled and it's in something that will take the heat away, it really isn't a rush. George is fitting it in increments, working one piece at a time. Is it a good idea to key the tang? I'm not sure what you're trying to ask, Adrian. Uh, the more that if you put little notches in or something, so it keys in when you put the epoxy in. So, so, so it, can, it can be helpful, but the shape of the tang itself will do an awful lot. So the taper already on the tang will help, but notching it, if you've got a grinder or something, will help. Thanks. Have you ever used hot glue instead of uh, epoxy? We're gonna, talk, we're gonna talk about glues in a bit, Chuck, if that's okay. But yes, yep. um, it's, I'd strongly recommend hot glue. Uh, the options broadly in gluing are hot glue and going for the, um, harder setting hot glues. If you go to the pound shop, it tends to be more rubbery and you end up with a knife that wobbles around in your blade a bit. So it tends yeah. to be better off going to a, a quality uh, um, type hot glue, but you can equally use epoxy. Um, some people adore the quick set epoxy. Personally, I find that a little too quick for aligning the blade and things. So I, I tend to use the slower setting and it's also stronger by coincidence. But equally, there are lots of people that just super glue or quick cyanoacrylate their um, mm. blades in, in as well. So that there's loads of options. Um, personally, there's some challenges with the cyanoacrylate. It tends to be more brittle. So it wouldn't be something that I'd be gluing in under high pressure. But I do glue in cold rosin knives because they're not taking the same sort of pressure and loads as perhaps yeah. a Sloyd knife. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so there's a variety of gluing. Um, the key thing while gluing though is uh, to protect the blade and to get the alignment through. So lots of looking. Yeah. So when you're, when you guys are, are putting these blades in for depth, are you taking it right up to the end, like the, the back edge of the blade itself or do you leave it a little proud? Really good question. If you look, uh, there, Yvonne's taken a lovely photo there. If we can just hold still a second, George. Can you see that there's a slight gap between the very end of the blade and the start of the handle? Yep. One or two millimeters, you know, maybe three at the absolute outside. Really helpful technique is to leave that little bit of a gap for when you're sharpening. It makes all the difference. Yeah. 
Yes, and, and right now, um, so I burned in the tank, I, I cooled down the blade again. Um, I will take off the, uh, the, the, the uh, tape now. Um, and um, yes, you can always um, go and uh, shorten the tank a little bit more or something. Uh, so I would not glue it to the very end and mainly um, heat up the, the, the tip of the tank because usually you don't need to go too far to the cutting edge to, to avoid uh, heating that up. So, yep. so this is now a little bit messy. This new nice blade is a little bit sticky now, but yeah. Usually I would like clean it up nicely, but. And if anyone's interested, that's the stage I normally cut myself with, taking the tape off the <laughs> <Yeah. of> technique. <laughs> So it's um, it's nicely aligned. Difficult to see. That's yeah. good. Looking not too bad. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I want not, will not. So I, I, I it needs a little tweak here and there. So I will not hot glue it in right now. But uh, yeah, that's that's how it goes until here. So I can switch now the blade. Uh, so I have uh, the rest of them here. I haven't uh, put a handle to it. So I will hot glue it in now. Hey, hey George, I'd like to uh, put a question in. Yes. Sorry, my voice is not so good. Um, what you've shown is using the burning method to shape the hole, but you still intend to use some adhesive, whether it's a uh, super glue or hot glue or something else to bond the two together. I think the other method is to burn the handle in. And once you get it two thirds of the way in your last your last approach, you push it in and leave it in there. And the heat from the knife has brought out the resins in the wood and it creates a bond with no glue needed at all. So you've burned it in and, it, and that's it. Um, I, I know that not all woods work equally well. I know that cherry does work quite well for that because it does have these stinky resins that come out when you burn it. But I didn't know if that was an approach that you've tried also. That, that's what I usually do with my files. Uh, when I burn in files, usually they don't need any extra hot glue or epoxy or whatever. So um, with the with the carving knife, I would be a little bit more precious to it. But you're probably right that you can burn in the tank and you just burn it in. You let it cool down and you tap it a hammer. It in with the hammer in, in the last bit and um, probably that will secure the blade as much as it needed so yeah and, and it's the absolute classic technique for fitting chisels to chisel handles as well um, so so i think the slight difference in the technique with a, a, a sloyd knife is you're quite often pulling on it so um, personally i think i'd be preferring to put some glue on as well Mm -hmm. Yes, me too. So yeah. I don't want to say it's not possible, and I say it is possible, but I would put it a little bit glue. So it's a really good suggestion, Brad, and I, I think it's worthwhile of people trying. Right. Uh, I know it is possible. I've got three or four tools that were put in that way, and yeah, uh, Jody and I, and Jody's husband Matt, met at a workshop um, uh, doing just that. So, but you don't, you don't, you put it in when it's still smoking hot. You don't, you don't let yeah. the knife cool. The last. You're not allowing friction to do it. It's literally the 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 resins are creating the bond inside the wood. Mm. Yes. So Jackie was asking a question in the chat. Uh, she says, apart from burning in, is there anything that really changes in the process for tangs that are round? No. But maybe a round tang, I would not just only 
burn in um, because um, I think a round tank can like I think the resins from the wood would not be strong enough to hold that maybe especially well I mean in theory in theory I would think that you wouldn't even need to burn a round tank as long as your drill hole is matching the diameter of the tank you would literally yeah. just hot glue it hot, or epoxy it whichever you're going to do into the hole I see, yes. It's an interesting one, Chuck, because experience has shown me that you're actually better off with a slightly bigger dimension than the size of the right, tank. Well, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you get a piston effect where you get an airlock yeah. inside. Yep, that makes that true. That. So, um, what I do now, so the uh, the glue gun is now hot enough. So what I do, I put a little bit of hot glue in it. I stuck it in with something, a little bit more. Now you have to be really quick. Um, I like to heat up the tank with a heat gun a little bit. One of the nice things about the hot glue is you can actually remove it with a hot gun again, and you can uh, play yeah. with it as it were. If you're getting it slightly misaligned, you can heat it up a piece and realign it. Sorry, George, I probably just stole your thunder. Or if in the future you decide you don't like the handle, makes it much easier to remove than, than epoxy. Absolutely. Um, can you fit it in and place it with hot glue and then leave a uh, little, like, and leave space for the epoxy later just to make it harder? I, I'd imagine you could try to do that, but it'd be quite difficult to make sure you get a sufficient space left. As you can see, yeah. it tends to push itself yeah. out as you put the tool in. Yeah, but it's already done. And uh, so I think the only person ever complains about the hot glue was Oren in Israel, where it was like over 40 degrees yeah. Celsius. <laughs> so all the European or uh, uh, whatever covers uh, in the US when it's not getting when you're not in Texas or something uh, you should be fine with just the hot glue and you can see how quick it works now this is the part where you get cut again so better be careful not sure Hold if on. I missed it but how much bigger is the hole than the tank Okay, um, no, I didn't say that. So the tang was 6.2 millimeters and the hole was 6.5. So I leave, leave a, a third of a millimeter space for the glue. Is it a problem if it's more? No. No. You just put more glue in? Does that but, work? But, yes. Oh, perfect. Ma Thank maybe you. that's even a, a, a good uh, thing when the hole is bigger. Uh, you can um, even out some unequal lease. So if you have, if, if the blade is a little bit to the left, to the right, to whatever, you can uh, just um, drill the hole like half a millimeter bigger or a millimeter if, if, if you have the space in the handle and uh, just even out that with the glue as well. And make a difference if you messed up something before i guess that's a point of that thing so yeah um done with that so george looking at a list of things that we were going to cover We've while we've been going long covered some of the issues that um, we had on our list. The last piece seems to be talking about lamination and other techniques for making handles. Ah oh, yes, right. Um, but that doesn't mean. Please ask questions if we, if we haven't covered what you'd like or if you points you want to clarify. So. Um, So um, I was I wanted to show a stick to handle, but I think the time is running out. Um, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have a hard and fast, you know, fixed so time. It's more, it's more a question of just your availability. 
Yes, so a thick screw handle, um, a marble blade is really nice because you can uh, put a wrench, what is a wrench on back? And you, you have these screws that have a insert wrench. Um, and this handle, but it, it, it's now a little bit time consuming. So that this handle will fit this marble blade but I have to open up this slot really nicely. So I will put some more effort in it and use the jigsaw blade to open up that slot until the, the, the tang is like really in it. And then I will add this screw on the back. And then if you get, get these in brass, you can just file it away and you have a really nice brass pin on the back. Um, that's so fundamentally the same technique as before, but the hole goes all the way through the handle. It, it is slightly more tricky to do um, because you, you, you have to light a line over a longer distance. So your accuracy gets tested more and more the longer the handle. Yes. Well, for that kind of um, thick screw train, I would really recommend Phil's technique to just drill it with a lace or with a, with a, a drill press and first make a nice scary um, block of wood, drill the whole way through, and then create the handle. So this mm -hmm. is a stick through with a pin. So I have a little uh, Mokume plate here, and I just uh, opened up the, the, the hole like a little, uh, like a little um, trichter. Countersink? Yeah, and then, then you, uh, you just pin it with a hammer, and that's what's holding the blade in place. Um, then, if you're doing um, birch bark handles, um, the, my first attempts were I cut uh, birch bark to these um, scary thingies, um, but I wouldn't do that anymore today. I, I just punch out round. Um, you can get these. Uh, round punch thingies uh, and you punch out uh, round birch bark discs ah. then it's really nice to have one of these uh, pliers to, to make a stamp in a leather stamp so you make a hole in the middle you need to, to clean that as well before and what I do then is I have a block of wood and a brass pin or just a piece of wire or something. And um, I wrap around some uh, newspaper. And then I, you stack the, you put some um, tape on the block, you put some newspaper on the, on, on the stick, and then you put all the, Birch bark thingies. Can boom. I just emphasize the importance of putting that paper on, on the thread or the stick you're using? If you don't, yes. it'll all stuck together. Yes. So you put the paper on the pin that you can align all these rounds. And um, uh, I would use rounds because uh, the birch bark has these little brown dots. And uh, if you make squares, um, these, these black dots, they grow in lengthwise around the tree. So when you have rounds, you can see these uh, lines there. So you can just put them like this in different directions. So you get these brown spots all around your handle and not on the one side and the other side. Ah. And, really good tip. And then there's another block um, of, so imagine these are round, you glue them all together, you have the paper in the middle, but that fit, won't fit yet anymore. Then you put another wooden uh, thing on top and you just get two clamps and uh, you clamp the whole thing together. You wait until the the glue is is done. What kind, of, what kind of glue do you typically use to glue those? Just um, glue? I'm not, um, I think it's not so important. I, in this case, I used uh, uh, waterproof uh, wood glue, 
Okay. Uh, you can use epoxy, um, but in the end, I think it's not that important because you usually, when you use a birch bark handle, you you clamp it in in between something anyways. So yeah, you yeah. don't birch bark um, on the end of the knife handle or on the top of the knife handle. Yeah. So, so you, you can make some kind of block like this as long as you want it. And then you line that block on your handle and give the handle the final shape. Yeah. And with the paper around the stick, you get that off the stick and yeah, then you can redrill the hole bigger or whatever you need and create your handle with it. Um, the advantage of the birch bark is that um, it's not slippery when wet. So it's a non-slip handle when you, a lot of uh, fish, fishing knives are made with birch bark handles because you, you can work with it in water and it won't slip. Have you ever done no. stacked leather? I don't find it really comfortable on my hand. I'm not yet. So I, I haven't seen the advantage of stacked leather yet. So it's probably, it feels much better than birch bark, I think. But um, no, I haven't tried it, but I would mm. do it in the same way. Yeah, exactly. So I think to, to glue it together to a block and uh, with the paper and in between and a block of wood or some kind of wire everybody has yeah. at home. So it's really easy. Really, one, of, one of the nicest knives that I ever uh, got to use was one of, one of the very first carving gathering I ever went to. It was Oliver um, Pratt's knife that he had gotten from a custom knife maker. I think it was in Finland. Um, and it was a, a Puko knife, but it had a stacked birch bark handle and it felt so good in the hand. It was amazing. And so I, I raved about it a few times and Dwight very kindly made me a stacked birch bark uh, handle for a Mora blade with a piece of burl in between. And nice. it's it's wonderful. It's really, I love the feel of, of birch myself. Nice. Yeah, cool. And yeah. go for it. George, you so, finished talking about laminating, or should I talk about laminating wood? Yes, you can go um, take it over. This more laminating stuff. So, so just like um, laminating with birch bark, you can laminate with slivers, slivers of wood. You can play around mm. with um, precious woods, whatever you want to do. And of course, you can have separate uh, pieces of wood for your bolster or the top part, the nearest the blade part of your knife. A bit like Adam Ashworth and a lot of the other makers now do. Most people seem to end up with um, a semi-precious wood as the bolster because it tends to be a harder wood. Um, but it's all about style and preferences. Again, epoxy or waterproof wood glue are good glues to um, do that with. And simply clamping in a vise is the technique I use. And um, yeah, it's a good way of using up all those offcuts that we all end up with as spoon carvers. You can do something positive with them. And um, yeah, so back to George, if that's OK. Um, yes. Um, so um, Chuck, you have to pin my iPad. Yep, gotcha. Cool. Another nice thing is to try out blades is, um, is I have these aluminum tubes and different drilling holes and some screws. So if you want to try out uh, different blades, it's also sometimes nice to have a handle like that. And you can just stick in the blade you have. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit metal work needed for that. So, but... Sorry um, to interrupt, George. Um, Camilla's just asked, how do you get the surfaces smooth enough to laminate? So I use a chop saw and then use sandpaper, the same sandpaper I use for sharpening my knives to just finish it to get it smooth. Um, but I do know some more professional woodworkers that use a plane on the end grain and literally pl plane it smooth. Hope that helps, Camilla. Sorry, George. Yeah, 
Yeah, I would go with, uh, as Phil said, with rough sandpaper on a glass plate. I think that's a good thing to, to make it smooth. It don't need to be like super duper smooth, but no. like 80 grit sandpaper or 100 or 200 grit sandpaper would be fine. Um, if you want to uh, do some uh, more fancy stuff like, like this. So here you have a laminated thing, which is curved. Um, I did that on an um, old, really cheap cooking pot. <laughs> uh, so you have that around, and I put the sandpaper on the outside, and I curved the handle like this, and then I put this horn and put the sandpaper on the inside of the of the round, and sand it like this on the inside. So. You can do more fancy stuff like that, which sometimes fits a blade also quite nicely. Very cool. Yes. Um, I think that just about covers it, doesn't it, George? The things that we had um, on our list, at least. Yes, I think so too. Um, I think we, we try to cover as much as possible. I think you did an amazing job covering a lot of territory. Phil, did you want to talk through the pictures that you had on the Instagram post at all with your tools or no? Um, it might be useful. Let's quickly do it. Uh, won't spend much time on it though, Chuck. Okay, here, I'll share my screen real quick. Thank you. So uh, Rusty Rooster, Tom from Seattle's Blue Club, he uh, uses only these um, um, aluminum screw, um, handles so he always uses small uh, carving blades like a lot of uh, indigenous people use double-sided carving blades and he just his traveling kit is like one handle and 20 blades but the blades are all fit in one little box because he's just just screwing and unscrewing them and yeah so he can travel with a lot of blades with only one handle so, so my intent in putting the post out, Chuck, was really to show that you, you can do all of this. It very is homemade type things that you'll have around the house, most people. Uh, the, the people have highlighted to me that it happens to be a festal drill that, uh, that's there. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, but, but actually any hand drill and the old egg beater drills are just as good. In fact, I almost prefer them, to be fair. Um, the clamps are all from Aldi's and cheap shops. The drills are from cheap shops. You don't need expensive gear to do this. If we could go to the next slide. So uh, a, a caliper is a really, um, so a vernier caliper, a measuring caliper, really, really handy thing to do, to have around the shop anyway as a spoon maker. I find it particularly useful because although makers claim that they've got a fixed and standard size um, tang, most of them vary a bit. So it's worth measuring. Uh, so you know exactly where you are and it also gives you a guide of what sort of size drill holes you need to take i find a pair of calipers so uh, dividers some people call them really helpful in setting out to get center lines etc um everyone's got a japanese saw it seems nowadays i use an old-fashioned gent saw that would cost me well, in the states it's probably less than a buck for, from a second hand shop and they sharpen easy and goes a long way uh, um, a rule's an absolute essential. Uh, if you're not measuring, you're going to have some problems. Uh, the obligatory George pencil uh, that <laughs> marks, marks on wet wood. Uh, uh, and beside it are some of the long drills. They really are cheap as chips on eBay. They're, they're no more expensive than short drills, and they do make the job a lot easier. If you could, Chuck. Mm -hmm. So to try and encapsulate the process I use in a nutshell, a rough piece of wood that's squared up. If I'm going to do some laminating, I chop up some laminates. Again, I use a chop saw for that. So it gives me an absolute square edge and then face them up. I glue them together, which you'll see second to the last row, and then glue that to the handle. So the handle I pre-drill and then, sorry, Chuck, Sorry, I jumped too soon. No, we're reading each other's minds here. So the hand light pre-drill, put the laminate on and then line up because of the laminates are only a short section. So I know where I'm drilling from the start. Thanks, Chuck. 
and just a selection of knife handles. Um, lots of them are informed by George's design. At the furthest right is a really weird tool that I made myself. It's a really tiny um, uh, hook knife that I use for teaspoons and getting into deep corners. And believe it or not, it's literally just a bent branch, but it really works. I didn't think it was going to be as simple as that. I thought I was going to be playing with it. So right at the beginning, George showed you some um, more wacky looking um, asymmetrical type handles. Give it a try. Play with it, feel with it, and if it works, then it's good. Don't be put off by the the, the um, uh, um, cosmetics of it. Um, go for comfort and use. Absolutely. Uh, I think we're just about there to wrap up, but I'm going to leave the last word to George, if that's okay. Yeah, with the calipers, I have. Uh, um, if, uh, what you can do, you can um, buy a little magnet and um, glue just this epoxy, some a little brass pin to it. So if you want to measure your spoon bowl thickness, you can do that with, so I, I can't find this pin right now, but if you have a pin like this with holding with a magnet and you have a uh, digital uh, caliper, you can even point in to something to find uh, uh, mm. the thickness of something. And if you want to find the center of something, what a yep. tip, George. That was such a great tip. Just like a little uh, throwaway a tip, tip at the end. That's brilliant. And you have these these little it's this um, uh, right angle here and one in 45 degree in the middle and you just rotate your round thing and you find your middle easily. Brilliant, George. Kaylin's just asked a question about finishing. We did have that on our list to cover and we didn't. So apologies for that. I thought we'd sort of covered it on the way. Um, I think there's a lot of controversy. There are some covers on RUAC that um, are hard and fast over on not finishing at all. And as Kaylin says, that tends to mean that when you sharpen, you end up with um, debris on your knife handle and it gets a bit of a mess. Uh, I, I experienced that for sure. Um, perhaps those that are using diamond stones don't suffer that, but um, I tend to go with a bit of oil and I'll even wax occasionally, but I do use sticky wax rather than any hard waxes. George, what's your preference? Um, burn my handles. Yeah. <laughs> you can't see anything. <laughs> yeah. No, so if you have a burned handle, uh, that's really nice uh, uh, because if it gets a little bit dark, you won't realize it. Um, I usually only use um, a little bit of linseed oil, a few coats. I, I don't do much. Uh, I'm not so fancy with finishing pro the product. Um, um, also with my spoons, I just put like one or two coats of oil and that's it. So it's not debris. It's not dirty. It's a natural patina. Yes. So, <laughs> I can, uh, where's the knife I really love? Yeah, maybe, maybe that's a good um, example. So I think this is Black Locos. It's yep. one, coat, um, uh, one coat of oil. I, it was really my roughing knife outside the whole time, many times grinded. And it's, in this case, I really can say I even like the patina. So, yeah, that's no, no, no big deal. I think another uh, thing we didn't talk about is knife finish. Uh, what you can do when you do the, the, the burning, the brushing, you can bring out the, um, the, the growth rings, the, 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 and then what, uh, Am um, not Amit, uh, no, White. Ed White did a few times, just some acrylic rub it off again, uh, rub in something else. So this is, I think, black acrylic, then a little bit greenish, and then a silver stuff on top of it. Uh, this is just burned and a little bit greenish on top. Um, this is burned and silver in the depths. So, um, yeah, um, I would, I see it more like a technical advice to make knife handles and the design is more like on everybody's personal reference so um it's a nice thing to play around to play around with colors i really like to to color my knife handles as 
as different as possible. And what I always use is these, uh, um, when I have a birch bark handle uh, sheet, I, I put around different colors of wrapping so that you can identify your blade with the color. I mm. realize that the eye is much quicker with colors. So, and when you have like 10 blades, uh, you, you quickly see, oh, the green one, you know, oh, the black one. And um, so if the handles are more difficult, the, the, the easiest is to, to grab the right knife you, you're looking for, for example. So that's a good way to play around with colors. And I want to point out, there's a lot of handle material, which is like epoxy stabilized, whatever. Mm. So I talked with a, uh, with a professor on, on an art school and he said, the best handle for your skin and for your hand is a plastic handle because it, 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 it doesn't absorb this and that and blah. So um, you can see it as what, whatever you want, but Noah Fishman in Israel is now uh, lately playing around with a lot of uh, material. So this is, for example, is aluminium with glowing in the dark epoxy. This is uh, corn leaves in brown epoxy. This is some ivory, um, not ivory thingy. I have some, uh, you get uh, mother of pearl, which is uh, uh, imitation. You get more glow in the dark stuff. You get more mother of pearl imitation. You get snake skin imitation. So if you looking on any website with knife handle materials, you find the most fanciest stuff you can imagine. So there's a, a big variety. It's not so very slidey, I have to admit, to use a plastic handle, but um, there are there some- was they were surprisingly comfortable. I grabbed some of Noah's, uh, you know, uh, hand, you know, epoxy handled uh, ones, and I expected to really not like it, and it actually felt really nice in the hand. It really did. I, I thought they were going to be super slippery, and they're not. They're they're very tactily pleasing, so. yes. and they keep your color. They yeah. don't get all uh, dirty. That's a beautiful. They're yeah. like pink, very glossy pink, and never changes. And she carves all day. Yep, yes, absolutely. I, I'm really sorry for all the sloy people out there, but plastic <laughs> are unfortunately quite comfortable and funny to make and fancy and whatever. So, yeah. So um, I had all these plastic things uh, laying around from my knife handle pre-journey. And uh, yeah, I'm, I think I hop on that a little bit too the next days, probably, maybe. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Uh, thank you, everybody who turned out uh, to, to listen in and to ask questions. We really appreciate it. Um, before we sign off, I'm going to put out one last call. Are there any questions that anybody did not get to ask uh, before we let Phil and George go? If so, feel uh, free to unmute yourself and ask away. I have a question, if I may. Oh. Um, after hitting the, the blade in order to get it in, how long do you wait before putting in the epoxy? Because I know that hit does damage the epoxy in some way. If it, if it cures too fast, it turns yellow and weak. So how long do you wait most of the time? I would epoxy it when it's really cooled down, I think. So just cool, I, I would even, I would cool the blade down as quickly as possible. So if I fit it in, I would, put it in water to really cool it down, uh, clean it. So I think to, to do the epoxy, you need a little bit more preparation. So if you don't really glue, uh, uh, um, heat, fit it in and really leave it in like Brett said, um, then I would cool it down, clean it up and prepare everything, get out with the jigsaw blade, a little bit of the charcoal or whatever is in there clean out the hole a little bit, make sure that the blade really fits and then use the epoxy and then glue it in. And the epoxy gets weak um, up to 130 degrees um, Celsius and the best is even water. So the, the best way to remove epoxy would be 130 degrees water and a long time. 
which is not really possible because water doesn't only go up to 100 degrees Celsius, but I don't know. <laughs> That's what the guy in the epoxy <coughs> company wants. If you want to get rid of epoxy, 130 degrees and water, humidity, and a little bit of time. Thanks. Welcome. Question for Phil. If you're using exotics, do you recommend wiping with acetone if you're doing laminations? I haven't experienced any problems so far, but on some of the, like Colobo and some of those really greasy woods, yes, I would. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I usually uh, clean the surface with uh, rubbing alcohol a little bit, when, yeah. especially if you use uh, exotic woods. Uh, um, acetone would be a little bit more aggressive in, indeed, but maybe a good choice as well. Yeah. Thanks. The, the hot glue, there's different temperature ranges, low and high temperature. Does it matter which one you use or? Absolutely, Absolutely. it does. Sorry, George, off to you. When you're in Israel, you need the high temperature. When we're somewhere in Europe, Northern Europe, you can use the low temperature. <laughs> and now I give it to Phil, that's a much more precise answer to that. Uh, not at all, George. Uh, I, I, I made the mistake of using some, I think I said during the talk, uh, hot glue sticks from a cheap shop. Um, I wouldn't do that again. I definitely yeah. wouldn't. Um, I'd go for proprietary blends from, from a, a decent uh, supplier, which I think means it by default, it's the higher temperature. I hope yeah. that helps, Chris. That's I think Thank you. Also nice because the time slot you have to you can work the blade into the handle is quite limited so if you have a hotter um, hot glue um, you have maybe 30 Just seconds a more time, to yeah. pick the blade or something you know you have to play around with heat you have to be uh, well prepared because you have only like like 20 30 seconds to to fit the blade in so and you have to put some hot glue on the tang you have to put stuck some hot glue yeah. in the hole and and uh, mainly you only have one go. Sometimes yeah. you stick it, you can't even get it out again. So with epoxy, you can fit it in, out, in, out. You can stuff some more epoxy into it. So you have a little bit, a much better uh, time range to to handle the stuff. And hot glue is really nice, quick, and easy. So hot glue, a little bit heated up the tank, stick it in. That's it. So, but you have to be be sure what you're doing then. That's much and nicer. Can you heat the... To destroy the handle to get it off. So to fiddle around with a heat gun on a super duper blade, I would, so I would not heat the Nick Westerman blade with a hot gun, I guess. I would maybe stick it in the oven on maybe 100 degrees or something Celsius to get it out for like 20 minutes or just destroy the handle and make a new one. Chris, you were gonna ask another question? I, I think he's addressing it now. I, okay. if you, you don't like the handle. You want to change it. With the hot glue, you, you can heat it in the oven. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll just, just rack it off, you know? I would just there was put, a... put it in a vise and squeeze it, and then the wood will break, and the tang will probably, definitely will be unharmed, I guess. Yeah. And it's much easier to get the hot glue off than it is to get epoxy off. It's a pain. So, um, so, so a lot of the point we were trying to get across is it's really easy to make knife handles. The knives are a lot harder to make in comparison. So just breaking it off, Chris, if you've had enough of it, it's not suitable and make another one. Yeah. Kim you. asked a question on chat uh, that I don't think we addressed. She was asking best place slash websites to buy wood handle blanks in uh for the uk is there any does anybody know of a source for buying wood handle blanks um i know many resources in germany but none in the uk unfortunately so uh, so is that, yeah, give it a try georgia so so um in terms of handle blanks specifically for handles i don't know of any but uh, craft supplies and most of the wood merchants will sell wood um, that you can cut the blanks out of if you, if you want to do that. Um, Kim, if you send us a, an email, I'll try and find some resources and send them to you. Yeah. If you want to buy somewhere in Europe, Germany, 
There's Dictum, which is a really big supplier of uh, wooden handles. Um, there is um, uh, um, Zubils, this is a Nordic handcraft, also Nordic is Handwerk. They have a lot of, so in Germany, I think there are like 20 knife handle supply shops. So they are really a, a big variety. Um, um, also, um, wood turning shops have often these uh, 30 by 30 millimeter blanks for for um, for pens, for making turning pens and stuff like that. So um, they have mainly really fancy wood and really beautiful stuff. So uh, if you search in these regions of handcraft people, knife making and turning supply, um, you find a lot of really nice stuff. For, for example, yeah, this is some, uh, a poplar burl stabilized. So yeah, you can get really nice stuff there. So serious question here. Paul was trying to figure out why you would want a glow in the dark handle. And it's obviously for when you're carving in a complete blackout, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imagine you in the middle of carving and you now black out and you have to put, put away your uh, knife for safety. It's perfect. Or if those glow in the dark candles can cast enough light to carve by, you're all set. Perfect, perfect. You should also put glow oh, yeah. in the dark color on your hands. So you would there you hands go. off. <laughs> Brilliant. And if you use glow in the dark wood, you can just keep on carving in the dark. Oh, yep. Dark epoxy with your glow in the dark handled epoxy knife. I love it. I, I have to admit that I just had to buy it because um, I, you know, I always liked this glow in the dark stuff when I was younger or a kid or something. Yeah. So it amazed me that you have something and it's just glowing. And I have a they're, for, they're for mounting on your ceiling. So you have glow in the dark constellations when you go to bed at night. Absolutely. I definitely have that. Well. I'd like to add, um, when Phil said crap supplies, he wasn't talking about a general category like, like dollar stores. That's the name of the company, craftsupplies.co.uk, I believe. Well done, Brad. Thank you. Uh, uh, the reason why I was vague about wood is personally, when I handle a knife, I try to find a piece of wood that's got a memory connected to it. Somehow it helps me remember what I was doing. So most of the knife handles I've got there are connected with other people or places. And if it's from a place, I try and get some wood from that place. It, but it, there's loads of suppliers of wood. But if you get stuck, please do shout. Um, I just uh, there's one thing that just came into my mind which we didn't talk about yet. So. Um, uh, what's really nice is horn. Uh, so all the all the wooden stuff has a grain orientation. And if you have want to make a little hilt like this to cover up the hole for the blade, uh, it's really nice to use something like horn or plastic or something that doesn't have a grain orientation. So um, even ebony is is really nice for that. Or, or you have these nuts that are uh i think chung nuts or something so um they are false ivory yeah the tongue. yeah while, while you're looking uh maya from uh sweden was asking if you ever use bone and yeah i think yeah. you were bone and ankle were yeah really good materials bone yep. and this is all stuff you can really, uh, when you really want to make a really nice knife, you always have the problem that the tang glue in part is really ugly, sort of. What, uh, but you need to really fit this hill yeah. to aid. And that's not really something that's always easy for everyone. So you need really fine files, you need really fine jigsaw and everything. So, but, uh, I like to do that sometimes. Sometimes yeah. I'm a little bit too not um, yeah, uh, 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 Sometimes I'm not patient enough to do that. But if uh, I would recommend uh, to fit the hilt to the blade and first glue the hilt to the blade. Uh, so what's really useful for that is if you have 
this little thing. Uh, so I can clamp the, the blade up here. Uh, I need to yeah, secure it with the bolts. And um, then you can um, so what I would do is use a five minute epoxy, glue the hilt to the blade, clean up everything what's um, leaking from the epoxy towards the blade. And then after that, I uh, fit the blade into the handle and I can screw, screw it down and leave the epoxy time to, to cure. So to, to build yourself uh, a little jig like that, if you want to, uh, if you're into more fancy handles or do these uh, stick through, no, how, how, how do you say, um, these laminated Thank stuff, you. Yeah, uh, something like that is really helpful. Uh, you just have to manage that the blade is centered with the, with the bolts. Yeah, that's what I use for that. That's also really nice for, for connecting all the stuff together when you do the birch bark stuff. Hey, Brad, I see you have your hand raised. Was that an accident or are you look, looking to ask a question? Oops, I asked my question. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. If there's no more questions, then I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Was there anything else that anybody wanted to ask? Um, I think we should say thank you to the people that have joined us. Don't you, yep. George? It's been great. Thank you for everyone for your contributions. Um, please get in contact if there's anything we missed or you want to know or there's loads of resources on the internet too. So it's just the way we work. There are loads of other options. Thank you all. Thank you, Phil, for helping me out doing all this stuff. That was really nice that we just could play the ball forward and backwards. That was really helpful. I hope also that everybody get, um, get, get rid of the fear to just make a knife handle and just do it. So my, my big shout out is just make your spoon mule, even if it's shitty, make your handle even if it's shitty and just try it and just do it. <laughs> Uh, just forge a blade just just do all of that because it's much easier when you just do it and try it and you will find out that it's maybe even fun <laughs> so awesome I, my goal i really would want to try to make as many possible uh, many knife handles as possible the next until the show and tell so uh, I, I will try to make as most more different stuff so just look out for that. And I think Phil will join in that as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, so maybe we, you find some more stuff you want to ask. And yeah, that's why we hate. So happy to see awesome. you at the and show what you do and ask in between if you want to. And Chuck, can I just do a quick last shout out because George hasn't and I don't want him to get in trouble with his wife, but the camera person Yvonne did a fantastic job. So many thanks, George. Yes, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Thank you, George. Thank you, Phil.